our study in Genesis. So please turn to Genesis chapter 30. Book of Genesis chapter 30. Make it our way through our study here. We're deeply involved in Jacob's life. <clears throat> and um, had some weird stuff happen last week in Jacob's life where... Um, Long story short, Jacob left home, went to his uncle's house, Uncle Laban, and uh, Uncle Laban, uh, well, when Jacob arrived, he saw Laban's daughter, which would be Jacob's cousin, her name was Rachel, fell in love with her, and decided to, uh, since he had no dowry to give Uncle Laban for his daughter's hand, he said, I'll work it off. So he contracted to work for seven years for Rachel. Uh, At the end of the seven years, uh, all the excitement had built up and uh, Uncle Laban threw a nice little party. They had a little wedding celebration. Uh, Jacob got a little drunk, went to his tent, and dad... Uncle Laban delivered not Rachel, but Leah, the older sister. And uh, yeah, that was weird. Uh, So all that to say that he ends up with two wives, and they have made servants. And from these four ladies, polygamy, it's weird. But from these four ladies, uh, 11 sons have been born and a daughter, a daughter named Dinah. So... um, Yeah, once uh, the morning came, Jacob realized it wasn't Rachel that he'd just spend the night with, but Leah. He was furious. He goes to his now father-in-law and says, you tricked me. And um, another deal was made that, uh, well, I can't give the younger before the older. So Leah was the older sister. It was required that you had to have her first, but... If you want the younger, then you're going to have to work another seven years. Uh, So that's what's happened here. We're picking up at verse 25. Jacob has been living with Laban in his little kingdom, Laban's little kingdom. He's been living there for 14 years, and he's become a shepherd. Jacob has been tending Laban's flock for him for these 14 years. Um, It says in verse 25, let's just pick it up since my mind just went blank, so we'll just pick it up at verse 25. As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go, for you know the service that I have given you. So as I said, uh, Jacob has been living here in Laban's home for uh, 14 years. He's been under contract to work for him. And uh, those 14 years have expired. Um, Rachel, uh, the one that he really loved was Rachel. Uh, She had been unable to have children until apparently here it tells us in verse 25 that as soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob comes into Laban's office, and uh, apparently this, the, the 14th year had expired, and he is now uh, like, time's up, man. It's time to go home. I've fulfilled my obligation to work for you. <clears throat> so uh, he says, send me away, right, that I may go to my own home and country, Really important, brothers and sisters, that I want to remind you of something, that on Jacob's trip from home to Laban's house, which was a long way away, Jacob went from the promised land all the way east to modern-day Iraq area, okay? 800 miles or more. Before Jacob left the promised land, remember he had a dream, and God Almighty revealed himself to Jacob in an interesting way. Jacob, in his dream, he saw a ladder, angels going up and down on the ladder, and the Lord saying 
to him, I'm promising you, Jacob, that this land is going to be your land. And you're going to become a whole people group. And I'm with you, and I'm never going to leave you, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bring you back to this land. So Jacob wakes up from his dream, sets a pillar up, a little thing of stone, and pours oil on it, and he called that place Bethel, the house of God. That's what Bethel means, the house of God. So he worshiped. He had his He had a vision of God. God came to him standing at the top of this ladder. Jesus is God. So I suggest to you that Jacob had a vision of Jesus. Now whether it was the same Jesus that appeared in the New Testament, it's immaterial. He appeared to him. And Jesus, God, said to Jacob, I'm going to shepherd you. I'm going to I'm going to be with you and I'm going to bless you in all that you do. I'm going to guide you and I'm going to protect you and I'm going to bring you back to this place. So for the last 14 years of Jacob's life, he's had burned into his heart and mind the word of God that was promised to him in his vision, in that dream that he had there at Bethel. And that's what's come to pass here, brothers and sisters. Send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Brothers and sisters, this is not our home. We are just passing through. If you have been born again of the Holy Spirit, then you are a new creation in Christ. We are a son and daughter of God through the (laughs) forgiveness of Jesus on the cross. And earth is not our home. Heaven is our home. And that was absolutely true, and in a sense there for Jacob, very much true for him. That in those long years of of hard labor, working for Uncle Laban, his father-in-law as well, he just constantly had this reminder. He must have kept reminding himself. This is hard, it sucks, I don't like the labor, the working conditions were not good, the hours were long, the wages were poor. He was a poor man. He was rich in the things of God because he had that wonderful vision, that wonderful promise, God speaking to his heart. And it's just interesting, isn't it, that we come to this verse and 14 years have passed. That means his firstborn, Reuben, is 14 years old. Interesting. What's the old saying? The days are long and the years are short. Right? You're going to wake up someday and it's like, oh my gosh, they're graduating. And off they go to college. And then they graduate and there's marriage and there's, nah, nah, nah. life goes on and so quickly. And it was absolutely true in Jacob's life. Reuben's a 14 year old or, lo- or older. He was the firstborn to to Jacob. Reuben's a man. Probably got a little facial hair. Sort of eats all the time. (laughs) Jacob's got a lot of mouths to feed here. He's got 11 sons. He's got a newborn. Rachel's nursing all the way up to this 14 year old. Reuben's voice has changed. Dreaming of a driver's license talks less, spend more time in his room, grunts a little bit. How you doing? Uh. <laughs> right? he's, a, he's, a, he's a young man. <laughs> Jacob has been a shepherd. He has become a shepherd. Laban was a man of some pretty good means and some resources. And because of this contractual thing that we've talked about, Jacob has been shepherding his flock for the last 14 years. Flip over to chapter 31. Let me just make a point here. Chapter 31, uh, verse 40. Jacob here having a conversation with Laban, but he describes his life as a shepherd. Chapter 31, verse 40, there I was, by day the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. 
These 20 years, now we'll explain that in a minute, I have been in your house. I've served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you've changed my wages 10 times. Okay? So wages, hours, and working conditions. This is what unions are built off of, right? Uh, His wages, hours, and working conditions were horrible. Life as a shepherd is a very challenging life. What's that famous verse in Luke chapter 2, right? The Christmas story. Mary gives birth to baby Jesus in Bethlehem, and it says the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks by night. And then the sky exploded with angels in a vision of glory. But they're staying out there awake, and it's cold. And the sheep, they don't care. They belong out there. They're just laying down, chewing their cud, just as content as can be. The shepherd, he's got a lot on his plate because there's predators. He's got to stay awake. There's a little one gets sick and he's got to wake. It's much like being a mom, right? You have these little babies that get sick and it's just time consuming. Okay? So that's... That's Jacob's life, 14 years. So what I'm saying to you, here's how I envision this little scene. He comes into Laban's office, smelling like sheep, bags under his eyes from lack of sleep, right? And uh, probably very weathered and tanned from all the, the extreme conditions out in the field all those days and nights. Right? And he's poor. He's just got simple clothing. Maybe he's got a staff, a shepherd's rod in his hand. Right? Send me away that I may go to my own home and country. So the scene that I have in my mind is that it's just that. There's there's Jacob. He goes into the, the office of his boss, his father in law. His uncle is also his employer. He's the boss. So he walks in, and Laban, in my mind, and this is just the way that I've built it in my own, because we think in pictures, but in my mind, Laban's, he's in a well-furnished, expensive, and expansive office. Big mahogany desk. Maybe a little taxidermy on the walls, paneled walls, right? That desk is situated in front of a big window that looks over his vast empire, right? Maybe an animal skin on the floor, leather chairs, the smell of fine tobacco. It's luxury, right? It's luxury. Things are really nice in Laban's world. And here comes this poor shepherd. And what's he say? He basically says, let my people go. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, isn't it? This whole thing is going to get repeated later in Israel's history. A poor shepherd's going to come out of the fields, Moses, and he's going to walk into the leader of the known world and say, let my people go. Essentially, it's the same thing. Send me away. Laban must have known this day was coming. For Jacob, he put a mark on the calendar. And when that day comes, because he wants to go back to the place that God has promised him. He wants to go back to Bethel where he saw the Lord. That's his home. He's just on pilgrimage here. And so he says to Laban, I think it's the way that it reads to us here that, uh, you know, send me away. I, I can't really go unless you release me from my obligation. I, I know the time is up, but I've, I've got to have this permission from you. Uh, give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go. For you know the service that I have given you. I think Jacob initiated this conversation. 
I think that he's come to know over his 14 years, especially what Laban did with him with Leah, and as we read there in chapter 31, changing his wages frequently, he did not really care about Jacob. He didn't really care about Laban, that is. He didn't care about his own daughters. His daughters will say that in chapter 31. Our dad took our money. He doesn't care about us. Look what he did to us. He's, he's, this is a horrible guy in situation. Laban is a heartless covetous man. He's in it for what he can get. So I just want us to understand that uh, I think it caught Laban a little bit flat-footed. I, I, I think he just thought, I have duped Jacob, I've got him on the payroll, and he's just, he's got his family here, he's got nothing. He probably can't even pay for the trip to go back home. And he's got all those mouths to feed. Right? 11 kids, for heaven's sakes. Can you imagine the grocery budget? <laughs> Serious. I took a stab at it once, not long ago. I asked my son and daughter-in-law, I was like, what's your grocery bill? Because I watched my grandson eat. He was over at the house last week. Like three burritos went down like <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so I just took a guess. So what is your grocery bill? I was way off. Hundreds of dollars off. Per week. <laughs> yeah. So Jacob's like, he's got all the, right? So he's like, he's not going anywhere. This is my thinking. So I see, you know, you read verse 27. It says, and Laban said to him, if I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. All right, so you might have a little footnote at the bottom of your page there, divination. It could be read, or I have become rich because of you. The Lord has blessed me because of you. I have gained off your hard work. You know, by the way, it's interesting that Laban had a lot of animals, a lot of flag, and that's where your wealth was determined based on, on in, back in those days, on your livestock. Uh, you never hear of Laban himself ever tending the flock. When Jacob met his daughter, Rachel, she was bringing the sheep out to get a drink of water at the well. You never hear of Laban actually getting his own hands dirty. So he's, everybody's doing the work and he's collecting the revenue. The bottom, he's a bottom line guy, this guy Laban, right? So anyway, the way that it reads there, it's as if I have found favor in your sight, he, he sort of, it strikes me as he's a bit caught off guard. It's like, uh, yep, it's time to go. I wasn't ready for this conversation. He quickly kind of recovers, it seems, and he says, well, I've learned by divination uh, that the Lord has blessed me because of you. I want to say a word this morning about working. <laughs> All right? This is the greedy, covetous boss who has increased, his wealth has increased greatly off the back of the man of God, and or, or I will say over the man or woman of God who's been working for him. I just want to say a word about that. Oh, that it would be true that your future employer would say of you, the Lord has blessed me because of you. I don't think for a moment that Laban really is a true believer in God, in Yahweh, like Jacob, but he does recognize the hand of God on his man, on his employee. And, and I, just, I just want to say to you, brothers and sisters, working is godly, okay? Working is godly. It's part of the creative design. God made Adam. There was no sin in the world. He put Adam and Eve to work. They worked side by side in that garden of Eden. And it's what occupied their time. And they were blessing God. They felt fulfilled and blessed 
in their design, in their creative order, by working. And uh, Jacob, as I say, I, I think that the, his vision from the Lord just burned in his heart. And he's like, you know what? I'm doing all this. He's making a boatload of money off of my back, but my satisfaction is in the one at Bethel. And so you might want to say, well, man, that guy's getting filthy rich and I'm doing all the work. That's what you're hired for. Sorry. If you don't like it, you can be a Jacob and go, I'm quitting. Well, then quit. I guess find another job. But you might find another employer who is going to be the same. They are deserving of the profits of the company that they oversee. So that's my little rant as far as that goes. <laughs> I just wanted to, I just thought it was an amazing thing that uh, Laban would say to his employer or his employee. God's blessing. I have been blessed. You know, his little boy, Joseph, who's back in the tent, nursing from Rachel, they have no idea, do they? Then in just a matter of chapters, right? Days are long, years are short. In a matter of chapters, when Joseph's about 17 years old, he's going to end up in Egypt, and he's going to rise to power, and Pharaoh's going to say, the Spirit of God is on this man. The Spirit of God is in you, brothers and sisters. So let your witness at your place of employment be one that uh, represents Him. That your people that you work with or work for will say of you, yeah, the Lord is, is doing some good stuff here. If you're an employer, <laughs> then you could turn the whole table around. It's like, Pay your people. Take good care of them. Give them good living wages and working conditions and hours. Take care of your people. That represents the heart of God equally as well. In fact, as much, if not more, because you're a leader. So Laban, so I'm sorry, I dragged that out a little bit too long maybe. Laban said, if I've found favor in your sight, I've learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. And I think what's going on in Laban's mind here uh, is that he's, he's quickly trying to recover, right? Because he's got to do something. But again, he knows Jacob really can't afford to go anywhere. He has nothing. He's changed his wages 10 times. Probably just gave him enough to live on. Um, so Jacob said, you yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had a little before I came, and it has increased abundantly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? All right, so I think that just sort of proves that Jacob has nothing uh, he probably had thought through this. He's like, well, in order for me to leave, I'm probably going to have to indenture myself to this guy for a little bit longer so that I can maybe start to accrue some cattle of my own because that's where your wealth was tied up in your cattle, not so much in the shekels that were in your pocket. All right? So verse 31, Laban said, well, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through your, all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Laban said, good, let it be as you have said. All right, handshake. Deal. Laban's like, you fool. <laughs> All right? Let me explain why he might have said that. Because the multicolored, the speckled, spotted, the black, those were the, the minority. All right? They're, they're, the, as the goats and the sheep would, would breed, it was sort of the recessive gene kind of a thing that would produce these sort of rare, not so common 
uh, looking animals, right? Generally, you'd get pure colored, white usually. Uh, so Jacob being very, seemingly very uh, agreeable here, he's like, well, so I'll take all the speckled ones. I'll go through your flock today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pasture all your flock. Well, I'm not, I'll do that. But I'm going to separate those that are multicolored from those who are pure. And uh, I'll take care of all of them, but the ones that are multicolored, those will be mine. And then, uh, you know, Jacob's got a plan here to, to breed those, and hopefully he'll get more and more speckled and spotted. So Laban's like, good. That's a good idea, Jacob. <laughs> Let's shake on that, right? So, and probably, so out he goes. Jacob's like, okay. And Laban, I'm guessing, is just laughing, <laughs> just chuckling. He's like, what a fool. What a fool. You're not going to get speckled and spotted. Like, you just, you just, what are you going after, man? <laughs> My goodness. You know, an interesting observation before I go any further. Jabin, Jacob comes into his boss, Laban, and he's like, Give me my wives, give me my children. They're more valuable to me than stuff, okay? It doesn't matter that we don't have a lot. I know that's hard for you to understand, Laban, but what little bit I have, we're so happy at our home. So just give me what we, give me my family and let me go home. It's all about people. What's Laban's response? It's all about money. What are your wages? You've made me wealthy. It's money, money, money. That's his, that's his understanding of happiness. I think it was Kent Hughes who said, Laban knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. No, that's really well said. And so when he says, good, good, oh, that's good idea. Jacob, good idea. Go. Go back out and tend the flock in your sleepless nights in the cold and all that. And give me the, uh, the plain white ones. All right, verse 35. But that day... Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in the charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. Did you just read that? Did I just read that correctly? Yeah. He stole his sheep that he took his future promise inheritance that he had agreed to. It was all Jacob's idea. Laban's like, ha, ha, ha. He took those speckled and spotted, gave them to his sons and separated them so far away that there was no possible way that Jacob was going to get on in life. I'm telling you, Laban is a bad man. He does not care about people. He just cares about himself and building up, further building up his own empire. Living proof here. Okay? So then verse 37. Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees, or chestnut, peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, the watering troughs, that is the watering place where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks, and so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. Ah, uh, that's weird. <laughs> okay. 
There is no scientific evidence, even to this day, that uh, impressions made on people uh, <laughs> will produce something of that impression. And I'm trying to say that delicately here, okay? <laughs> even to this day. Why did he do that? I don't know. It's, it's an odd thing. Some people say it was sort of a superstitious deal that was, existed back in the day. Okay, there was nothing about that that would, you had a, you got a piece of wood with, that he peeled the bark off of it and put it in a watering trough and then the, the, the white animals would come to drink because Laban took all the speckled ones. And then they'd drink, they'd mate, and they'd produce speckled. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> I just like saying speckled, so it's... Uh, <laughs> Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flocks. So he separated what was his, what he had earned rightfully. He separated them from Laban's. So over here in this part of the pasture, you got Laban. They're all white, all white. And over here in this part of the pasture, maybe he's got Reuben working for him now, his oldest son, who knows. But he's, he's managing the whole thing. Some of it's Laban, some of it's his. Jacob's a good shepherd. And those, those animals that now are, resemble that piece of wood, they're now his. They've come under the care and the ownership of this good shepherd. So he also did a little selective breeding. Verse 41, when the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the watering troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger's Jacob's. <laughs> He's like that dirty, rotten guy. I'm going to get back at him, right? Uh, so as he saw this uh, weird sort of breeding thing going on. Uh, that's what he did. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants and camels and donkeys. So six years, this took, it took a course of six years as we read in chapter 31. Jacob saying, I worked for you 20 years, 14 for your daughters, six years he's been going at this now. So apparently the milk and the meat and the wool, he's been going to market, he's been selling these animals and their animal products and he's been earning good money because he's got strong animals that uh, God's been blessing him in all of this and uh, he's been able to hire some servants and to get some camels and donkeys. He's got his own little thing that's grown up right inside of Laban's empire and it's become pretty substantial and now he's ready to leave. So God has blessed this man. The good shepherd has blessed the good shepherd. The hero to this whole story is God, who promised Jacob, I am going to be with you for all the time, everywhere you go, and I'm going to bring you back to this land. And so even though Jacob had been uh, abused and, and uh, taken advantage of multiple times, God was faithful to him and uh, blessed him abundantly. I want to point out to you, if you just look down at chapter 31 again, um, it says, let's pick it up at verse 8, uh, uh, Jake, no, sorry, verse 6. Uh, this is Jacob speaking to his two wives, <laughs> Leah and Rachel. He says, you know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, the spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock bore spotted. And if he said, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. All right? In the breeding, so let me read that again. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream 
these spotted animals. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. Okay? So that weird thing with the sticks and peeling the bark off, God blessed that weird thing. There was, again, there was nothing actually genetically, scientifically proven about the, the stick thing, but, but God took his weird little endeavor and God put a blessing upon it. As he sometimes does. Right? Uh, there was an occasion in, later in the Old Testament where the bones of the prophet Elisha uh, he had been buried and, and somebody took uh, hastily uh, took a man who had, had died suddenly and they put him in Elisha's tomb and when the dead man touched Elisha's bones, the man came alive again. Right? There's nothing magical about the bones. There's nothing magical about Jacob's stick. Right? It's just that the, the good shepherd put his divine blessing on Jacob's efforts, and he increased him greatly there in that foreign land, right under the eyes of Laban. So that's, that's what's described here. Uh, the angel of God said to me, Jacob, I said, here I am. And then in verse 13, this angel of God identifies as God. I am the God of Bethel. So I say to you, brothers and sisters, it's the Lord. It's our Lord. The same good shepherd. They, they stood in the temple and said, I'm the good shepherd. It's, there's no change. God cannot change. He's God. He's the same always, from beginning to time to the end of time. Our Lord is the same. In the impact that he had on Jacob's life, was seen by his boss, and it made a big impact for generations and generations to come. I, I'll be honest, that's really what I want to talk to you about today, is the, the powerful witness that came out of one man's life who lived faithfully for God. The powerful witness. I want you and I, brothers and sisters, as Pastor Eric was encouraging us in worship, to build our lives on the Lord. And that happens through that just daily taking up our cross, beating down the flesh, receiving fresh forgiveness, repenting of our failures, going back and serving the Lord because He's just that good and He's just that faithful. I'll never leave you. I'm with you always to the end of the world. And then as life goes on, days are long, years are short. I don't know, I guess because I'm getting older, I'm thinking about these things. I had a friend who passed away suddenly, not long ago. It's had a big impact on me. It's beginning to take a, and, and I've stood out at the end of my driveway multiple times thinking about my mom and dad. It's like, Lord, what's the meaning of Tom Hathorne's life? Of Barb Hathorne's life? What did it all mean? They're gone. They're in heaven now. Praise the Lord. Would you tell him I love him? He can do that. But you stand back and you go, you know what? I sat down at my mom's writing table that I inherited because I wanted it, one of the few things I wanted, and I opened up that writing table. And my mom was the consummate card and note writer. Her calendar was coveted because she would write in the birthdays of friends and family members uh, on, on the particular day of the month. And guess what? You'd get a card from my mom. Sometimes there'd be a little cash inside, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? As a kid, right, you get, here comes mom's card. You open it up, you're shaking it out for the cash. <laughs> What'd she say? That's secondary. <laughs> I'm a Laban. But I sat down to write a note. I said, now I know why. My mom loved people. My dad loved people. Dad ran a big farm. 
had a lot of responsibilities. But you know what? They had a lot of friends. And they made a big impact on a lot of people. What impact are you and I going to make? Jacob's life is going to call back in a matter of a couple of hundred, three hundred years. His life is going to call back to people, Jewish people, who are going to be enslaved in Egypt. Everything that we've seen here is just a microcosm of what's going to take place in a much bigger way in a matter of years. People are going to go into Egypt. They're going to work for a tyrant, Pharaoh. He's going to enslave them. And then they're going to want to get set free. And God, they're going to go in very small and they're going to come out huge. Jacob went in all by himself. He came out as a family. Israel's going to go into Egypt, just 70 people, Jacob and his family. Hundreds of years later, they come out millions. God blesses them and increases them right underneath the nose of that evil empire. Don't you think, brother and sister, that Jacob's testimony had to have spoken to those people who found themselves in that situation? Those people that were enslaved by Pharaoh. Let's wait a minute. We've got in our own history, we've got a man, one of our forefathers, Jacob. And look what God did in his life. Oh my gosh, we're, we're living out the same thing. It's happening now to us. It must have brought huge encouragement to them. Didn't change their circumstance. But they also, by the way, were holding on to the word of God, the promise the promise of God that he had made to Abraham. Your people are going to go in, they're going to serve a guy, a country for 400 years. I'm going to bring them back out. So what impact is your life making? Have you met the Lord personally? Do you know him personally? Are you filled with his spirit? Are you building your life on his grace and his goodness to you? You loving one another and forgiving one another? Yeah, it'll leave a mark. Jacob is living and working inside Laban's little kingdom. Now I want to make a point with you. Do you know names have meanings in the Bible? Anybody know what Laban's name means? It means white. Weird. Whitey. <laughs> Laban means white. Doesn't necessarily have to mean anything. Snow is white. Manna was white. Milk is white. So white can have a neutral connotation. White sometimes can be very evil because leprosy was white, as it would appear on the skin. And that became a very strong biblical type, leprosy, a type of evil, moral evil and sin. White well, can have a very positive connotation as the fine linen that the high priests would wear was white. In fact, in Revelation, it says we're going to be given fine linen, which is the righteousnesses of the saints. It represents the moral purity of God. Laban was white. At first when Jacob meets Laban, Laban appears to be good, friendly, hospitable, generous, took him right into his home. Ah, oh, my young nephew, never met you. My sister Rebecca has moved away so long ago. Stay with me for a while. Provided, took care of him. But then he turned. Laban was a deceiver. He was a heartless thief. He was an idolater. He was a liar. He had no compassion for man. He was greedy. I say all that because there is a bigger type going on here. 
that Paul said that the devil comes as an angel of light. He appears to be really good, but he of course is a deceiver, deceiver. Revelation 12, 9, deceiver of the whole world. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Laban never spent a day, at least we have in the Bible, not a day with the sheep. They were there for his prophet. And he is a liar and a thief. He's a type of the enemy. And Jacob was living in that kingdom. And he was being blessed while he was living in that kingdom. So I say to you, brothers and sisters, if you're getting beat up by the devil recently, I just want to encourage you. 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And the context there is in the context of an antichrist, of those who go out, appear to be white, but they're not. And maybe you've been taken advantage of. Maybe the devil, Satan's name actually means slander. He's an accuser of the brethren. And maybe he's gotten into your head and he's just, you're feeling a sense of con- condemnation from things that you've said or done. You just call on the Lord Jesus Christ and say, set a hedge around me, Lord, because greater are you than even me and greater are you than him. He defeated the devil on the cross rose from the dead, took away his sting, right? Jesus is the good shepherd. He's guided Jacob through this whole thing. One last thing in closing, uh, since we're talking about the Lord, we're talking about living underneath the guidance of the Holy Spirit that he's given us. There is a beautiful scene of the gospel here in this little story. You got a piece of wood with white on it sitting in a watering trough. Then there's new birth. And that which comes from that new birth resembles the stick, the piece of wood. And then they come under the ownership of the good shepherd who guides them all the way home. That's the gospel. That the glory of God, Jesus Christ, on the cross, right? Christ died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. That white, I suggest to you on that stick, that piece of wood represents the righteousness of Christ on the cross, placed in the water. You repent of your sin, you will receive the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for your conversation with the woman at the well, where he reveals to us that water that is drunk refers to the receiving of the Holy Spirit into your life. So we look at Jesus on the cross, we repent of our sin, we drink of his spirit, so to speak. He comes into us, now I'm owned by the good shepherd who laid down his life for me. And he's promised me, I'll get you home. I'll get you all the way home. I will guide you and I will never leave you. Isn't it interesting that Jacob separated his from Laban's? Interesting. That's kind of a heavy word, brothers and sisters. Because Jesus said when he comes again, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats there will be an ultimate separation. And there'll be a lot of all mingling together, but the Lord knows who are His. He calls them all by name. And He'll separate unto Himself those who are His. And they'll say, enter into the eternal kingdom that was established for you from the foundation of the world. So look to the Lord. Be born again. Created in His likeness. Right? Right? Amen? Let's stand and pray. Thank you, Lord, for the life of Jacob. And we see your life working in him. So we commend ourselves to you, Lord. Just fresh this morning, we thank you for 
the testimony of the cross of you being there, the righteous for the unrighteous. Rising from the dead and giving us new life. So Lord, we, as we sang this morning, we surrender to you and uh, because you're just worth it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessings to you this week.